It's time for the Bill Ferguson Show. Hello there. This is Phil Ferguson, and you are listening to the cleverly titled The Phil Ferguson Show. A lot of fun stuff coming up today. We have an interview with Darren Slade. Uh, he has been on the show before and talked about his leaving religion adventures and the problems that that caused and updates on where he is now. And he is a critical scholar, a scholar of the Bible and religion and has journals and stuff like that. So he's doing fantastic, and we're going to hear all about that later in the show. Also, I have a segment on home loan versus investments, just because people have asked about that. And I also have kind of a, a re-review of some of the problems people have had in their portfolios, where, uh, at least at the time I'm recording this, the market's down, as measured by the S&P 500, something like 20%. And, it, you know, each episode, the number is different because it goes up and it goes down, mostly down the last few months or so far this year in 2022. But I've had people that come to me and say they've lost 30 or more percent, not this 20 thing that you're mentioning, Phil. Well, just to break out the two funds that I use to cover the S&P 500, the Vanguard Large Cap Growth Fund and the Vanguard Large Cap Value Fund, as of today... The large cap growth fund is down something like 31% and the large cap value fund is down eight. So if you had a mix of those two, you would have something really close to what the S and P 500 does or has done. If all of your funds happen to be chasing the same handful of hot stocks, large cap growth stocks, uh, you could have really big losses, 30% or more. And this is something I've talked about for years to not be overly concentrated in what's hot. And the unfortunate downside is while it continues to be hot, you might slightly underperform the hotness. And uh, this is also <laughs> linked to, in my head, uh, FOMO, the fear of missing out. Well, I'm not afraid of missing out. I'm perfectly happy with really big returns. And keep in mind, calendar year 21, the market went up 28%. So even if it falls a whole bunch like it has, you're still up from where you were January 1st of 2021. And so the market doesn't go up every day or every year. It goes up and down. It's a long-term thing. Well, we're going to talk more about that in those segments. Uh, the one other thing I want to cover and make sure everyone is aware, I have been delaying this announcement because I've been really busy. Huge pain in the ass to move Polaris to Florida it's not officially, officially done, but I'm hoping it's days away. Of course, extra work in buying a second house, finding a second house, putting stuff in the second house. And just this morning, my brand new headphones arrived. You, you think you have everything that you need. And yesterday I was like, oh my God, I had an interview. The one with Darren, who's going to be later in this segment, in this show. And I didn't have headphones. And you have to have headphones to, to make a quality, quality sounding uh, podcast, in my opinion. So I went to Walmart. All the headphones are wireless. I had to have wired headphones. So the only headphones that had a wire at all that you know went over your head were $10. So I bought a $10 set of headphones and a little packet of a cord extension and a size conversion uh, connector adapter to actually plug it into the soundboard, the controller, the processor, whatever we call this thing here. So yeah, 20 bucks on $10 headphones <laughs> and they sounded like $10 headphones. Oh my God. But now I have on, let's see, hang on a second. And the Sony, what is this? MDR7506. See how good that sounds? Could you hear it? Wow, absolutely fantastic headphones. Now, 
The reason I bring up all this stuff is that a lot of it is coming to an end. It's wrapping up. Uh, regular listeners may also know that I had um, some extra stuff I had to do because my brother passed away. And thank you. Thank you for everyone that has sent me the kind wishes. But now things are calming down. So I think I have a little bit of a window or a little bit of an ability to take on a couple of new clients. So uh, my minimum is going to drop temporarily from its current 5 million down to 2 million. Now I know that for the vast majority of people listening, they don't have 2 million. I get it. I'm sorry. I really wish I could help everybody. I even just had uh, an email in the last day or two where, and this has been suggested before that Phil, that I create a Polaris plan mutual fund. And then all you'd have to do is go buy the mutual fund. It's a nice idea. Uh, I'm pretty sure that's going to be a lot, a lot of work and hassle and regulations and bureaucracy and difficulties and uh, insurance requirements, a lot of work and a lot of money out of pocket. I really do like the idea, but I just, at this point, can't even fathom that that's going to happen. So the best bet, and I just did this, redid this a few episodes ago. You can go back and listen to the Polaris plan broken down in six parts. And, you know, it'll get you really close uh, if you if you do all the work yourself. And some people are good and want to do that. Other people not want to do that. And that's fine. If you like the plan, you like the ideas, and you have $2 million or more, you can send me an email phil at polarisfinancialplanning.com. Just to be clear, because of new regulations from the Department of Labor, your 401k or 403b or anything else from work does not count. I cannot bill on it. I cannot even give you opinions on it. So that doesn't count. Uh, Any assets you have in your house or if you own an apartment building or farmland or a million dollar boat, that doesn't count. I'm I'm looking at, from a business perspective, the accounts, the funds that I can manage will set you up an account at TD Ameritrade. And then, of course, somewhere next spring, summer, or fall, it will switch over to being at Schwab. But there is this window now. We're not, you don't need $5 million to hire me. You need $2 million. So if that is you... If you have two million or more of assets that can be managed at TD Ameritrade and, and then Schwab, and not linked to your employer or property or a building or something like that, I'm going to uh, allow open up for a couple more clients. And it depends on what the response is. If uh, the response is very slow, I maybe I just stick at two million. I am concerned, delightfully concerned, happily concerned. There is the possibility as soon as this segment goes out that I'll get a whole bunch of people that would meet the $2 million criteria, but weren't meeting the $5 million criteria. And so if I get drowned and a whole bunch of new people, uh, the very next episode, I might say, I'm done. It's going back to 5 million until I can have a chance to fairly and justly uh, provide the quality service to the people that are brand new hiring me without hampering the service or the quality of people that have been clients for a long time. So there's that minimum is going from 5 million to 2 million effective. As soon as you hear this, uh, maybe even before you hear it, because as soon as I'm saying it, it's effective. But if that's something that interests you, you have more than 2 million in manageable assets. Send me an email, Phil at Polaris financial planning.com. Of course, if you have less than that and you have some questions about investments, you can always email me, phil at polarisfinancialplanning.com, and I can try to answer your questions or we can set up an appointment and you know talk more or do a review or something. But whew, that's enough of the intro stuff. We're going to take a quick break and come back w- with the Investing Skeptically segments, more than one today. And then after that, we're going to have the interview with Darren Slade. So don't go anywhere. You're listening to The Bill Ferguson Show. The history of discovery, particularly cosmic discovery, but discovery in general, scientific discovery, is one where at any given moment there's a frontier. And there tends to be an urge 
for people, especially religious people, to assert that across that boundary into the unknown lies the handiwork of God. This shows up a lot. Newton even said it. He had his laws of gravity and motion, and he was explaining the moon and the planet. He was there. He doesn't mention God for any of that. And then he gets to the limits of what his equations can calculate. So I don't, can't quite figure this out. Maybe God steps in and makes it right every now and then. That's, that's where he invoked God. And, the, and Ptolemy, he, 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 he bet on the wrong horse, but he was a brilliant guy. He formulated the geocentric universe with Earth in the middle. This is where we got epicycles and all these, right. all this, the machinations of the heavens. There was still a mystery to him. He, he looked up and uttered the following words. I, when I trace at my pleasure the windings to and fro of the heavenly bodies. These are the planets going through retrograde and back. The mysteries of the earth. When I trace at my pleasure the windings to and fro of the heavenly bodies, I no longer touch earth with my feet. I stand in the presence of Zeus himself and take my fill of ambrosia. What he did was invoke, he didn't invoke Zeus to account for the rock that he's standing on or the air he's breathing. It was this point of mystery. And in gets invoked God. This, over time, has been described by philosophers as the God of the gaps. Mm -hmm. if, if that's how you, if that's where you're going to put your God in this world, then God is an ever-receding pocket of scientific ignorance. If that's how you're going to invoke God. If God is the mystery of the universe. These mysteries, we're, t we're tackling these mysteries one by one if you're going to stay religious at the end of the conversation god has to be more to you than just where science has yet to tread so to the person who says maybe dark matter is god if the only reason why you're saying it's because it's a mystery then get ready to have that undone The Phil Ferguson Show is for educational and entertainment purposes only. Nothing said on the show should be interpreted as personalized investment advice. Investments should be based on your personal situation, and you, of course, should consult with your financial advisor or tax professional before taking any actions. All right, today we're going to jump into the mailbag. I have a great email about home mortgage rates and whether you should get one or not. And I know other people are going to ask this, and it's something I've been thinking about for a while, but wasn't quite sure where to fit it in or how to cover it. But but now I know because I've got an email. So I'm going to read the first, yeah, I think it's a sentence. The first sentence doesn't give any way, away any personal information. So let's go with this. Um, I've heard your analysis and rationale for financing a, a home purchase rather than paying cash. But with rising rates, what is your opinion on break-even rate when it starts to make sense to pay cash if one has the ability, end quote. So, of course, if you don't have the ability and you just need to buy a home and you're going to have to pay 5 or 6 or 8%, whatever it is, you know, then that's what you're going to pay. And it's kind of a moot question to you. I was trying to think about the first home that we had I don't remember exactly, but it might have been close to 10% interest. Does that sound right? Uh, it's a long time ago, but 10% uh, because I do remember that house and following houses as we matured in life and had a few more dollars to buy something nicer that we kept refinancing the homes because rates kept going down. And at this time, our current home <laughs> for a few more weeks uh, in Chicago is... Uh, 3% loan. So if someone's going to lend me 3%, they're going to lend me money at 3%, which might be partially tax deductible. Please check with your own certified tax professional on this topic. Uh, you might be able to write off some of the interest payments and some of the uh, uh, property taxes, but it, it may or may not be available to you. Um, at 3%, I don't pay a penny early ever. I'm going to I'm going to pay that as long and as little as they'll let me with the expectation that somehow some way given enough time I am going to average considerably more than 
in a stock market. So I'm going to take that every time. That's me. Now, how high does Phil go? 4%? Yeah. 5 I think so. 6 Six, we're starting to get to a point where I'm going to have to think really hard about it. Now, if you're paying 6% long-term mortgage, 30 years, 6%, again, keep in mind that that might be partially tax deductible in your situation. So if the 6% loan effectively costs you four and a half because of some ability to deduct that from your taxes, you want to know that number, the lower number, the actual effective interest rate based on your tax situation. But on the other hand, at 6% or above, paying it early or just paying the house for cash is kind of the same thing as getting a guaranteed risk-free rate of return of 6% or 7% or 8%. And so what I want to have a nicely balanced portfolio, and maybe you're very aggressive and you're all in stock and you always will be, and you think nine to 11% is what you're gonna make. But if you have some kind of reasonably balanced portfolio and your expected long-term rate of return because part of your portfolio is conservative in bonds or the cushion as we call it here, um, maybe making six and a half or 7% might be what you calculate as your expected annual return. And so if you can make a guaranteed risk-free rate of return of 6% on something, Wow, I'd have to think about that really hard. Now, for me, um, if given that choice, I probably would still choose the 6% loan. Uh, I wouldn't be very excited about it, but I'm going to play I'm gonna play the odds. I'm going to play the odds that I can borrow the money at 6%, get some partial tax write-off, so I'm paying something slightly below 6%, and uh, go, go for it in the market. Now, I might also change my mind if the market had just had three years in a row where that's made 20% per year because now I'd be, you know, a little less optimistic of the short-term market returns. And when I say short-term, I mean the next one to three to five years, not today or tomorrow. I, I have no idea. Uh, but often, not always, but often when the market has three or four really good years, it's a little soft the following couple of years. But we have examples where it's hot for three years and then it continues to be hot for a couple more years, but it just feels a little more risky. Uh, if on the other hand, the stock market, like, and the market's been down considerably this year, 10, 15, 20%. It's done really well recently at the time that I'm recording this. And of course that might change, but if you find yourself in a point where the market, the stock market suddenly drops 30, 40, 50%, and you think at some point in the future, a year, three years, five years from now, it's likely to recover, the gains that you could make won't be the normal nine to 10 to 11%. So that, that might change my opinion too. It also might be something to think about considering you and your goals and desires and your level of, of, uh, Rolling the dice out gambling, I don't know. Uh, taking the risk of the stock market, you, your spouse, your loved ones, um, other things like that. If you think that uh, buying a new house and getting a loan for it is just going to give you anxiety, then pay it off. I mean, assuming you have the means to and assuming that it doesn't hurt your cash flow and your investment portfolio from some other angle, just buy the house. Of course, there's always the possibility of a middle ground. As an example, you could put 50% down instead of the traditional 20% or being creative and finding a way to do something even less than 20%. You could put 50% down. You could put 70% down. You can put whatever number and kind of weigh the pros and cons of both, both approaches by having some kind of dollar amount in the middle or some percentage in the middle. The other thing that you could do is you could do something like I did with the new Central Florida house that we've bought and we're moving to in the next couple of weeks, um, I got a five-year arm. Now, when I agreed to get the five-year arm, the stock U.S. stock market was down considerably more than it is today. And my thought process was 4.5%, which is what I locked in at, is still a pretty low rate. And in five years, if interest rates jump a whole lot, I could always 
pay off the whole house again or a generous portion of the loan. And while the loan rate can go up considerably, it does take some time, you know, every six months or every year or two. So even if I didn't pay off the house 100% five years from now, I could do it over the fifth, sixth, seventh year. And the uh, dramatic increase in interest rates for the variable loan wouldn't hurt me too much because I would have the means to pay that off. If you're a younger person, then you expect to stay in the house for a long time, saving in one to one and a half percent to lock in only for five years, knowing that the rate could go, my rate could go theoretically to nine and a half percent, and you're probably never going to be able to make more than the monthly payment. You probably don't really want to do that. You're just going to have to pay the higher rate and lock in, keeping in mind that even if it's now 6% for a home loan, it's been a whole lot higher in the past. It might be higher in the future. So it it all depends, I guess. But something north of 6%, I'd start thinking about it. Uh, an interest rate, home loan interest rate, 30-year rate, north of 7%. I'm going to really have to think hard about just paying cash for the house if I was in the position, if you were in the position to do so. So... Hopefully that helps. Uh, Some thoughts about home loans versus investments. Pace e lunga vita. Lunga vita e prosperità. The Phil Ferguson Show is for educational and entertainment purposes only. Nothing said on the show should be interpreted as personalized investment advice. Investments should be based on your personal situation, and you, of course, should consult with your financial advisor or tax professional before taking any actions. I had a real nice email and conversation with a listener who was in a bit of a shock when somewhere in the past few episodes, I might have said something like the U.S. stock market is down 15% over the last year, and he was Stunned by that, I guess, because his U.S. stock part of his portfolio and the funds that he is using, the funds that his advisor has bought for him, he claims are down something like 30%. And I was like, well, I don't know how that would be possible on a broadly diversified portfolio. Hint, foreshadowing, that might be part of the problem. But uh, I said, well, you know, send me one of your statements and and let's look at a couple of the uh, U.S.-based stock mutual funds that are actually in your portfolio. And he did, and we had a great conversation about it. And I thought, hey, you know what? You might be interested in something like this as a listener to the show, so we're gonna go over it. Before I do that, I wanna get to a a reference point. This was, um, when is this? This is uh, September, early September of 2022, in case you happen to list the, to this later. If you pull up the numbers, you'll get different numbers because I'm pulling from today doesn't really matter the exact numbers. I'm trying to illustrate a point that goes to the question that I discussed with this listener. And so as of today, when I pull up Vanguard Total Stock Market Index, VTSAX, I do show a one-year performance of minus 13.26. And again, like I said, if you pull it up on a different day, it could be several points better or worse. Uh, so don't you know rely on that too much. And this is, oh, by the way, um, at Morningstar.com, free to use. You can get tons of information. What you do with the information is up to you. Uh, don't look at the stars. That's completely worthless. I've done segments on that and can do it again if you're interested. But you can click on the portfolio composition and you can find out that the total stock market index, which is 98.22% U.S. equity, which is good, 0.85% non-U.S. equity, and 0.93% cash because they have to have some cash on hand for um, redemptions or sell, or selling shares or buying shares, buying a new stock. You mean you just can't magically buy stock without money. And the fund overall, when you look at the Morningstar style box, which again, it, it's just a way to look at it. It's not necessarily the right way to look at it. Even the total stock market index is vast majority of it is um, large cap. Matter of fact, let's see here. They've got 30, 60, 70, yeah, 
70% is large cap. So it's still very heavy in large cap. It's heavy in growth. And one of the reasons I don't use this, I mean, if you only have $5,000 or $10,000, this is perfectly fine. But one of the reasons I don't use it for larger accounts is because you can put money in mid cap and small cap. You can wait and value and growth. And we just went over all of that in the six part segment of the Polaris plan before. So I'm not going to go too much into that, but a reasonable facsimile of, of, of the performance you could expect if you did nothing else and just had the total stock market index in the last 12 months measured as of today, early September, mid-September of 2022, minus 13%. So in this person's portfolio, they happen to have a couple of funds that were generous portions of their portfolio. So I figured I picked the three biggest ones and we're going to talk about them. One is American Funds Growth Fund of America A. And I don't know if I've mentioned this in a long time. I don't normally recommend, I don't recommend generally, um, managed funds, but this is a managed fund. It's a huge managed fund. And when you have a fund title or description with a random letter out at the end, it's probably a load fund. It just so happens that this fund has a 5.75% sales load. So you lose almost 6% of your money on day one when you put your money in. You have to make 6% or 6.5% or something just to break even, which is one of the reasons I say don't buy load funds because they're collecting a lot of money from you and the result you get may not be that impressive. Well, the one-year performance for this fund is minus 24%. Wow, that seems odd. Let's take a look at the portfolio and see what it's invested in. Um, it is, let's see here, heavier into growth, which growth hasn't done as well as value in the last year. So that might be part of it. But uh, 40, 75% large cap and a bigger bias towards growth. It has 79, basically 80% in US stock. 10% in non-US stock and 9.5% in cash. Wow. So with 9.5% in cash, generally speaking, in the long term, as the market goes up, you're going to miss out on a lot of the upside because this fund is sitting on 10% cash, 10% international, which is not huge, but that also means you are losing some of that clarity and the granularity that I like to use which again, we covered in the six part segment. So let's look at the next one. T row price, blue chip growth. Okay. Blue chip growth. Let's take a look at the portfolio real quick. And as expe expected, uh, this is huge in uh, large cap and growth. And let me check the weightings here. Wow. This is almost 95% large cap meat uh, blend, which is growth and value. And, but the most of it, 78% is large cap growth. This is very, very large cap, very, very much growth. The blue chip, uh, I guess would tell you that it's going to be large cap, mega cap, but uh, it's waiting in large cap growth. This is basically a straight up large cap growth play. Um, the other one was pretty much that way too. Oh, and the performance, let's see, click on this other tab again, all of this from Morningstar. For the last 12 months, minus 32%. Ouch. That's got to hurt. Um, now, the third one is the Fidelity Contra Fund. So theoretically, it's contrarian, and they're investing in value, uh, maybe. They're investing in things that are out of favor, because otherwise, why would you call it the Contra Fund? But keep in mind, the names and the titles of uh, mutual funds mean pretty much nothing. Uh, this one in the last one year is down 24%. So all three of these funds compared to the total stock market index are down 10 to 20% more than the total stock market index. In uh, Let's see it in the portfolio from a generic top view perspective. Again, mega cap growth. Um, let me break down the weight, this one has 2% cash, not too bad, 6% uh, international, 
1.75% other. I don't know what that is. And it's almost 90, no, yeah, 92%, maybe 93% large cap. And it has 83% of it is either uh, blend stocks that are classified as value or growth and 50% growth. So 83% bias to growth. Again, so all three of these funds, which I'm assuming the advisor, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, bought thinking they are three different ways to look at the market. Um, just real quick, oh, let's go back to this. Uh, Morningstar has a way where if you look up a fund and then go under the portfolio where I was to look at what part is growth versus value, large cap, mid cap, small cap, and all three of these funds are huge stocks. It's all, it's not even the top 500, it's the top tier of the top 500 and they're all growth funds. So these three funds generally are doing the exact same thing with different titles and the idea that maybe you have some diversity in your portfolio, you do not. But now I'm gonna look at the specific stocks. So if I go to, again, Morningstar portfolio, scroll down, um, this one is, which fund is this? The American Growth Fund will do the same three funds in order. It has, um, the top 10 holdings are 32% of the portfolio, and the top holdings are Microsoft, 6%. 6.24%, more than I recommend. Uh, Tesla, almost 6%. Amazon, Meta, Alphabet, MasterCard. Um, let's see, anything in the second set of 10. Netflix, Eli Lilly, Abbott, um, a couple of those names. A lot of it is the names that you, you know from the really large companies. Now I'm gonna look at T. Rowe Price Blue Chip. Go to Portfolio. Come on, internet. Scroll down, and it holds things. Microsoft, number one, 13%. The top 10 holdings in this are 62% of the portfolio. This is really not a diversified portfolio in any stretch of the imagination. Um, other stocks, Alphabet, Amazon, Apple, Tesla, Meta, NVIDIA, makes video um, chips for your car, for your computer. Eli Lilly, Dollar General, Alphabet, a lot of the same ones, no surprise there. And let's go to the Contra Fund. Contra, contrarian, right? It's gonna do something different. Um, it has Amazon, Microsoft, Meta, Apple, Alphabet, NVIDIA, Eli Lilly, um, Visa, Bank of America, Adobe. So the top 10 holdings are 50% of the portfolio. Now I want to look at the funny thing. I know what's going to happen. The Vanguard Total Stock Market Index. I'm going to go to the portfolio and it has the top 10 holdings are 24% of the portfolio, which, which is way better than the 35 to 60% from the other funds. The biggest holdings, you're not going to be surprised. Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, Tesla, Alphabet, Berkshire Hathaway, which is actually quite a huge company. Uh, Johnson & Johnson, NVIDIA. So these four funds, the three managed funds, and the one index fund, the Vanguard Total Stock Market Index, VTSAX, hold a lot of the same stuff. All four of them are heavily weighted as large cap. The uh, Total Stock Market Index does have 20, 30, 30 something percent. That's not large cap and it has more value than the others. And its performance in the last 12 months was minus 13. The other ones are minus 23 to minus 33, 32. So there's just some weirdness. Now, in different times, have these funds done better? You know what, let me look, hang on. Just, just I did not check this in advance, so we're gonna learn together here. The performance numbers, I don't know if these, I think these funds have been around a long time. Let me look at performance. Uh, over 10 year, the Vanguard Total Stock Market Index over 10 year is an average return of 12.48, 12.5 per year for 10 years. Not too bad. Actually quite good, maybe too good. Uh, American Funds A, again, not taking out for the 5.75% that you have to pay at the beginning. 12.5, uh, what was? 
yeah, 12 and a half, 12 and a half, about the same as the uh, total stock market index, the T. Rowe Price blue chip. You know, it'd be nice if I had this already, but it's okay. You, you get to hear it as it happens. Minus 13.2 per year for 10 years. And now the Contra fund is 12.8 per year for the last 10 years. And so these managed funds have held their own over the last 10 years. And this is probably one of the reasons they were recommended because they had done really well. And I bet if you take out the most recent year or two, they were probably showing numbers beating the total stock market. At least you could show that to your potential client if you're an advisor. Hey, here's some funds that are huge and have beat the market. They beat the market mostly because they were focused in large cap growth, which is the thing that has done the best up until a year or two or three ago when mid cap and small cap started doing better and definitely value way better than growth. But the advisor wasn't giving you a balanced portfolio. The advisor was selling you the funds that have had the best performance or really good performance in the, in the past. And one of these at least pays a pretty generous commission because the front end load is 5.75%. So if you had these bought in the last couple of years, you've lost a lot and you don't have a diversified portfolio. So that's something that I worry about where here you have three different funds. One includes the word Contra, Contra Fund, Fidelity Contra Fund. And you might think you have a different selections of U.S. stocks, but they're all, these three at least, are all large cap. They're all large cap growth. They're all mega cap, mega cap growth. You're not diversified at all. And all of these money managers, it appears, have a, what is it, a FOMO, fear of missing out. And boy, you don't want to not have Amazon and Microsoft when they're winning. So they're all buying the same stuff. And when the market changes and large cap growth, mega cap growth does poorly, your funds do poorly. So if you were in the total stock market index, you lost 13 funds like this in this scenario in the last 12 months, down 23 to 32, pretty awful performance in the last year. What did they do? What what will they do next year? I don't know, but it's really hard to beat the index. And so that's why I like the index funds. That's why I slightly shy away from things that have done too well over the last several years, because I want to avoid these problems or these corrections. I don't know. Hopefully that helps. Uh, just some thoughts in real time, maybe as, as I go through some U.S. large cap U.S. Um, managed funds that aren't index funds and comparing them to the total stock market index. I hope that helps. Hi, I'm back for more on this uh, fund number things because as soon as I finished that other segment, it came to me, well, you know what? These are such large cap growth funds that maybe it's not even fair to compare it to the total stock market index but my original point was you're not diversified. So we've made that point. But now I thought, oh my God, let me compare it to the Vanguard large cap growth index fund and the Vanguard large cap growth index fund. Let's see here. I'm going to the weightings again in morningstar.com. It is 85% a large cap and mostly 62% in growth. So very similar to the other funds. It has 99% in U.S. stock, 1% not U.S. stock, and 0.3% in cash. Again, lower cash generally is better. You want to have some on hand. They're, they're going to have some on hand, but one of the funds had 10%, so you're losing out on that. And I thought, well, how does this fund done? Uh, so let's go. Oh, and before I do that, here's some of the, the holdings. Uh, Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, Tesla, Alphabet, NVIDIA, Meta, Visa, Home Depot. Kind of the same kind of stuff. The really big growth stocks. This is the, one of the popular areas people have been investing in because it was one of the hottest areas of the stock market. The performance, let's see it. The performance number uh, one year as of today is 21 minus 21.8 minus 22. Now, Compared to the total stock market index of minus 13, 
this is bad, but we're looking at a, a segment of the market. The interesting thing is that this has beaten in the last 12 months, the other three funds, which have a lot of the same stocks. So here's your minus 22 and the others were minus 23 to minus 32. So even when trying to go to more of an apples to apples comparison, ignoring the fact that your portfolio is not diversified, if you were not diversified and wanted to have all large cap growth stocks, you could have this fund and still have done better than the managed funds. But the thing that I thought about, the 10-year number uh, for the Vanguard large cap growth is 13.97. I'm going to call it 14. And just, oh, performance. Hang on a second here. Just grab one of these. I don't remember what the, 12.8, uh, almost 13 for the Contra fund and almost 14 for the Vanguard large cap index fund. So you can make more in the long run. You can lose less in the short run. This is kind of what I expect from index funds. The difference in the very long run, one or 2% compared to managed funds, very normal. A lot of managed funds uh, in the long run underperform three to 4%. Most managed funds underperform index funds in the long run. And so when I looked only at large cap growth, these funds underperformed. When I look at the total stock market, these funds dramatically underperformed because they're not the total stock market. But anyway, beating a dead horse now, I'm gonna stop and go on with the rest of the show. Hey, poor, you don't have to be poor anymore. Jesus is here. Jesus had a tough life, boy. I read about that guy. Jesus is the only guy that ever came back from the dead that didn't scare the fuck out of everybody, man. <laughs> He's the only guy that ever crawled out of a grave where people didn't go, oh, oh! Oh, I just saw some fucker crawl out of this grave! <laughs> Jesus comes back, he doesn't get any pressure. No static, nobody's upset. He climbs out, he's walking around, nobody's upset. They can eat with him and everything, <laughs> you know? It's like, isn't that guy dead? Yeah, but he's real stubborn, man. He won't accept it. <laughs> Pass the butter. But... <laughs> what are they staring at? Ah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I read it, folks. I read that book. He's on the cross. 30, 40 Christians standing around going, it's a shame that he has to die. And Jesus is going, well, maybe I wouldn't have to. Somebody get a ladder and a pair of pliers. I don't know if Jesus has actually spoken in an audible voice to anybody in about 2,000 years. Folks. I think his last words may have been, oh, ah! oh not the other, oh, you jerk, oh. It may have been his last words. I'm not sure. Yeah, people say, you think Jesus is coming back? Sure. Sure. What's it been? What's it been, 2,000 years? Boy, I sure don't want to dampen anybody's optimism here. It's only 2,000 fucking years. Yeah, he's coming back. He's going to do game shows. We're going to go, Jesus, this is your life. Remember this noise. All right, don't tell me. Don't tell me. Give me a second. He's up in heaven right now. They're going, why don't you go back down to earth? Be a symbol of peace and love to the world help. He's going, yeah. Yeah. Sure. Help, huh? Yeah. Yeah, I'd like to help. Tell him I'll be there as soon as I can play the piano. You're listening to The Bill Ferguson Show. Welcome back, everybody. I have now a, a guest who's been on before and big fan favorite, Darren Slade. How are you, sir? I'm doing well. How are you, Phil? I, I am good. And you uh, have a, a journal, an organization. What, what the heck is that thing called again? 
at the Global Center for Religious Research. And that is that part of Sherm or Sherm something different? No, Sherm is a subset. It's one of our publications. Excellent, excellent. And are these publications out there in the public, just like a blog, or do they have to sign up for something to get them? No, absolutely. Um, we it, So it is a periodical. It's a peer-reviewed academic journal. And it comes out twice a year, so two, vo- two issues a year. And uh, each issue has about 10 articles. You can go to shermjournal.org and take a look at the different articles. So one of the things that we are really proud about with Sherm is we like to challenge the status quo. So we made this, we made sure this was a platform for marginalized voices to be able to promote, uh, to present their research. Uh, for those in academia, they know that there's a lot of gatekeepers. And so oftentimes us academics, we struggle getting our stuff our research published because it might buck the system a little bit. And we want to make sure we're giving a platform to those same scholars. Anyway, uh, you know, normal journal articles for other publications might cost upwards of 20 to $50 and ours are only two bucks each, uh, for in a single issue. Yeah. Not, not bad. Now you'd mentioned, um, getting other opinions out there. And I think this is probably coming from and an important segue, perhaps, t- to one of our topics for today is that the vast majority of people that do biblical studies, historical research, and I, I have air quotes up because <laughs> uh, I'm a little concerned myself, but when the vast majority of people that are trying to do scientific research into a topic, if they already are convinced of that topic, that it's absolutely true and there's no room for errancy, it's not really objective. Is, is that something that's important here? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, the, uh, the gatekeeper problem is, is widespread and it's for just about every field of study, but most especially in uh, the academic study of religion. Right. You're going to find, of course, the same people that you find mass producing tons of religious pr- product and that would be evangelicals typically are the gatekeepers even in higher end academic journals that claim to be uh critical thinkers and claim to be non-religiously affiliated so w- w- when someone quotes to me in an argument or a debate the the majority of christian scholars think or the majority <laughs> of christian scholars believe um it's it's one of those things that you know, if someone says to me, the vast majority of physicists think, or the vast majority of chemists think, uh, there's still, even in like real hard sciences, uh, sometimes there's this idea that uh, people that believe in old theories don't get converted to new theories, they die. <laughs> and and the right. science evolves and changes after the people that really promoted the old and now perhaps not as good, I don't want to say wrong, but not as good theories uh, have passed on. But with religion, the teaching is less flexible, I think, even than chemistry and physics might be. So um, you get people that they believe something first, and then they do, uh, and here's where the air quotes go up, research to support what they already have decided is reality. And and I think that's the case, but you, you tell me in, in uh, Christian and biblical scholarship, is that something that happens? Oh, yeah, absolutely. It's a rampant problem. Uh, One of the publications that Sherm just came out with uh, at the end of last year is an article called Dataset Examination. I'm a co-author on it. And in the article, we review uh, English language texts on the resurrection for the past 500 years to see what really is the consensus about do authors who publish on the resurrection, do they really believe the resurrection happened? Because this is a common uh, apologetic claim that um, Gary Habermas and others make, saying that the majority of quote-unquote critical scholars believe that there was an empty tomb and that the disciples really did believe they saw Jesus alive after his crucifixion. So when we actually took a look at the so-called consensus here, what we found 
was the vast majority. And we're talking hands down vast, vast majority of people who have published on the resurrection are themselves clergy members or priests. Ah, uh, so, so actually paid to believe this. Correct. Or people associated with a seminary. Absolutely. I always thought that was a funny word, by the way. It was seminary. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> also, also the uh, rectory is, uh, I, I don't know. <laughs> you know, given, uh, given the news of what we know with sexual abuse in the church, maybe it's not quite a coincidence. <laughs> well, the, the other thing that amazes me is that they will constantly tell us that that was back in the day and that's, that's been fixed in modern times. And then oh. 10 years later, we find new cases and they say, well, that was 10 years ago but it's fixed no. today. <laughs> no, not at all. Uh, we're, heck, the Southern Baptist Convention is under FBI investigation for their sex abuse scandals. So it, it definitely seemed, a rampant problem. It still. seems to be pretty close to a one-to-one -one correlation. Any uh, religious organization of any size that's been investigated, they found uh, child abuse. So Yeah, um, yeah. And it's not just them. I mean, we, yeah. Jehovah's Witnesses are going through it, and we and Mormons are going through it. We also know of even Buddhist temples that have had their own sex scandals as well. Well, I think there's something weird that when you are really close to the creator of the universe, <laughs> if you believe that, <laughs> yes, um, it, it's one of the rules I try to live by. I don't always succeed, but never believe your own bullshit. <laughs> um, and that's where a lot of people get in trouble because, you know, people tell you all these things that, about how wonderful you are. And as soon as you start to believe it, um, you might now feel that you're above, above reproach or something. But uh, I'm also really kind of saddened the percentage of human beings that think that doing things with little children like that is, I don't know if I want to say acceptable. I don't know that they think it's acceptable because they, they make a lot of effort to hide it. <laughs> Um, but the, the number of times that it happens is really, really odd to me for, for humanity as a whole, but whatever. Well, you know, I think what happens, uh, and keep in mind, we're also dealing with an environment that attracts kind of the narcissist and somebody who want, wants to manipulate or wants to, um, be seen as the authority. So this is a petri dish of authoritarianism of narcissism and manipulation um but you know one interesting thing is when people claim to be the righteous voice and we see this even with law enforcement they are much more willing to take kind of a machiavellian approach to things a, a means justifying the ends so I know what I'm about to do is wrong, but it's for the good of the kingdom or it's for the good of society. Yeah. So what I'm doing might be a little bit suspect, but the end result is worth it. Wow. Yeah, that's that's unfortunate. And you were saying, what was the title of this article? So this article is called Data Set Examination. And I'm pulling up the full title. So data set analysis of English texts written on the topic of Jesus's resurrection, a statistical critique of minimal facts apologetics. You know, us scholars and academics, we love long titles and, and <laughs> so we are obnoxious about it. Yeah, it's, it's quite different from uh, a lot of famous people that have one name like Jesus, Mary, Madonna. I mean, the one that sings in the 80s and 90s. But uh, yeah, it's a, it's a long title. And, and you were giving us some of the, the facts, but it, apparently the vast majority of people, the vast majority of the air quotes listeners, critical scholars, um, are tied with religious organizations where they probably had to affirm that they actually believe the stuff that they're saying happened when in their critical reviews. Yes, absolutely. And, you know, when data is being gathered by any kind of an advocacy group, whether it be apologetic and, and religious or political, uh, you need to immediately be suspect about the data that's being gathered. 
But more than that, what we're actually running into is what's called um, an unrepresentative or biased sample. Here. Right. So when you hear Gary Habermas say the majority of critical scholars believe in the empty tomb and other things about the resurrection, uh, he is, and I don't know deliberately, but he is lying. He is falsifying the data here. It is not the majority of critical scholars. It is the majority of publications that are out there and available. At no point has anybody gone and done an actual sociological survey of all critical scholars. And that's the problem. He misses a complete subset. There's tons of critical scholars who are atheists or just don't believe in the resurrection or they're Jewish or Muslim or something else. They were never surveyed in this. They would disagree with the resurrection. And guess what? They've never published on the resurrection because uh, it's not important to them. Yeah. I, I, for me, the word that caught in my ear was critical. What, what yeah. does it mean to be a critical scholar? Because you could be a scholar, I, I guess, and, and you could study and debate about the the characteristics of the leprechaun that's at the end of the rainbow holding the pot of gold for you. And and you can debate that and you can share and you can look for evidence to support that pro and con, but it doesn't mean you're actually critical. So Absolutely. And what we seem to be having here is an equivocation of the methodology of critical scholarship versus what critical scholar actually means. In academia, there are two types of scholar, if you will, when it comes to religious studies. There's the critical scholar, and then there's the confessional scholar. And a confessional scholar is someone who conducts their research from faith-based presuppositions rather than a critical perspective, which is tends to try and be very objective and not coming with a bias already in hand. So when they say critical scholars, um, that's not actually what they're meaning. For Habermas, he defines a critical scholar as someone who has a degree in the relevant field, uh, possesses a doctorate, uh, that he's a professor, and is published in a peer-reviewed, non-consenting publication. He means non-consenting as a non-evangelical. Um, ah, but I mean, to have a PhD, so eh, to have a PhD in in biblical studies, I guess, or religious studies or something like that. Yeah, or um, history. I, I'm assuming that, that that subset of people is does not include a lot of generally objective people or atheistic or secular or humanist. Uh, it's going to include a, an, an it, abundance of religious believers? Absolutely, yeah. It's okay. going... So just that degree alone, of course, the relevant degree, he loves to mi limit who is allowed to qualify because he's definitely not counting the anthropologists and the evolutionary psychologists. He's not including all historians. And we all know that a published professor possessing a doctoral degree in a re relevant field of study that alone does not qualify someone as engaging in critical scholarship. Yeah, it, it's kind of, I don't know if it's the right way to use this phrase, a catch-22. Um, you're defining the group, and the group that gets defined is the group that already believes. And so when they agree to believe and publish what they believe, they all agree to it. It's what they already agreed to when they started. Kind of Absolutely. They're uh, stacking the deck. Absolutely. Yeah, it, it, it's one of those things that sometimes when... I don't know, in today's world of confusing messages and so many people have the inability to decipher what is true and not true, the uh, percentage of people that still hold firmly to uh, the Christian propaganda, I, I have a hard time reconciling that with reality. I, I don't know. It just boggles my mind when I hear people say they believe in a literal three-day resurrection. And of course, I want to say, well, even in the Bible, it's not really three days. I mean, if you mean three 24-hour contiguous days. Right. Right. I mean, it's like a day and a half at the spa. Um, oh, <laughs> Jesus. Yeah. And, and I love to ask people, and correct me if I get this wrong, but from a Christian perspective, you know, people say, well, Jesus suffered and died for my sins. And I said, well, where is he now? 
Well, he's at the right hand of God. But does that mean he's dead or alive? Oh, he's, he lives now. But, but you said he died for me, but he's alive. Well, he died for a day and then came back. And I was like, well, that, that's not really much of a sacrifice. I mean, I, could, I get it. It kind of sucked for a day and a half or two. But now he's got the kingdom and the glory and he's at the right hand of God and can do magic. That, I'll take that. How do I sign up for that? That sounds kind of cool. Yeah, uh, he he sacrificed a weekend for you. Yeah, uh, <laughs> you know I think definitely from a Christian perspective, it has a lot more of a metaphysical connotation. The he was tortured to death briefly, uh, but the weight of the sins of all of humanity throughout all time that was so excruciating uh, that it was one heck of a weekend for him, basically. Yeah, it's I uh, yeah. I, I think we'll probably just agree on that, but uh, I don't want to beat a dead Jesus um, anymore. <laughs> anymore. But you have other projects, right? What what else you got going on? Yeah, our biggest one at GCRR is our religious trauma studies program. We actually have collected um, international scholars, specialists from all over the world, to discuss the causes manifestations and treatment options for those suffering from religious trauma. And we now actually offer a 30 hour certification course for clinicians and also for those who are suffering uh, so that people get the information they need about what is causing religious trauma, what's it doing to your body and to your brain and what are the most effective treatment options. Very nice. And, and is that something that's going to be published? It's in process now? Oh, no, no, this is all, it's full on. We have over a hundred students already. Wow. Certification course. Okay. And what's great about this is uh, the clinicians can actually get continuing education units or CEUs for taking this class uh, through their state's Department of Health. Oh, that's that's nice. So if someone is struggling then, uh, how can they contact someone to get help? What's the process there? Yeah, the uh, easiest thing is to look at what we're offering on our website. It's gcrr.org, and you'll see buttons for religious trauma research and tra- religious trauma studies, and it'll direct you right to our program. Now, is that a program to get certified, or is that a program to get help from someone who's certified? A little bit of both. Okay. Uh, not to get the help. We're not going to link you with anybody, but we do provide resources and information of where you can go. Because there are actual clinicians, therapists, and psychologists that specialize in religious trauma. And yeah. we present that information. Well, and I'd, I'd hate to think that I had religious trauma and I contact somebody and the first thing they tell me is that I need Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, uh, this is completely secular. We are not in the business of trying to deconvert anybody. Right. Um, it, for some people, maintaining a spirituality or, or a faith community is important. But of course, we're not going to encourage them to stick with the congregation or the community that abused them in the first place. I think that's sound advice. <laughs> <laughs> Kind of, kind of. And that's actually one of the unique things about GCRR is uh, while we we represent faith, uh, numerous faith traditions. Now, it is true a lot of us are atheists, but not all of us. I Many we have some of the world's top um, Jewish scholars. We have Muslims on our board of directors. So, uh, unlike other programs that claim to be addressing religious trauma they have a very overt agenda. Uh, we want to turn everybody into atheists is their goal. And we don't think that that's necessarily appropriate or healthy, especially when we're talking about a, a therapeutic context. Sure, sure. You want people to uh, get some help, some support, uh, an outlet where they can talk and, and work through possible problems. And But if if they're in a harmful situation. I think this is generally good advice. If it's religion based or not, uh, removing yourself from the harm is probably generally a good strategy. Is that? Yes, <laughs> absolutely. Right. Getting out uh, beyond my skill sets here to make these uh, prognostications. Excellent, Darren. Well, what else is going on? 
Well, we are in the process of releasing a number of exciting new books. We just released a book on the Hebraic gospel series. And so the very first Bible commentary is on the book of, on the gospel of Luke. And what's really significant about this book is it is taking a theory that's been developed by Israeli scholars and it's very controversial, but again, that's kind of our point. We want to present information that might not be heard elsewhere. Right. They believe that the gospel of Luke may have actually been the first gospel to be written, not Mark. And that Mark and Matthew actually based their stuff off of Luke and that Luke may have actually originally been written in Hebrew or Aramaic. And this got this Hebraic gospel series identifies verse by verse in the gospel of Luke, all the different Hebraisms and the different type of colloquialisms in first century Palestine that seem to potentially indicate an Aramaic or a Hebrew undertext to the Greek Luke. In other words, the gospel of Luke that we know of, the original in Greek may have been a Greek translation off of the original. And that's what this book explores. I see. And and they can't just go interview Luke and ask him? Right. No, that's, <laughs> uh, that's not possible yet. We're working on it. <laughs> and, and do they think there was an actual Luke or were the author or authors attributing to him to get to... Uh, I don't know, a more, I don't know what I say, very toss or something to it. Sure. Yeah. Which obviously is common, right? The, the, uh, attributing a writing to somebody in the past is, was prolific back then. Uh, we can use the word Luke to uh, describe, to name and label the author, but still the author is anonymous. We have no idea who luke is or if his name really was luke yeah that's yeah, very very the common is that he was the companion to the apostle paul right but that's of course church tradition yeah f fair enough fair enough are you going to any upcoming conferences that uh, my listeners might be at secularism humanism atheism well the society of biblical literature is hosting their conference in November here in Denver, Colorado, which is where GCRR is based. So we're actually going to have an entire symposium on that Hebraic gospel series. So we'll be actually doing that. And, and where can and they we, learn about that on the website again? Yeah, I think um, for this one, you'll want to go to SBL or the Society of Biblical Literature, and you can get the information about those con that conference. GCRR is hosting our uh, Holocaust Studies conference coming up in November as well. I'm sorry, it's at the end of October. Okay. Is our Holocaust conference. And then there is talk that we will be hosting our third annual atheism conference on atheism probably in December. There's talks about that happening. Sure, sure. Fantastic. Is there anything we haven't covered that you want to get in before we part and I send you back to work? Well, I do want to mention one other book that we published by the really famous Frank Zindler. Frank Zindler it was a uh, colleague and friend of John Randy. And so both of them are internationally known for being debunkers of the paranormal and Frank Zindler just published with us a new book called The Amityville Horror, An Inquest into Paranormal Claims. And in it, he gives a day-by-day -day breakdown of how the entire Amityville Horror is a complete hoax and fraud. And we're talking, it is one of the most exhaustive, <laughs> detailed debunking of a paranormal claim that I have ever seen. And it is just fantastic. So you can actually see all of our publications and stuff on the GCRR website. Nice. Has, has anyone scooped up the movie rights yet? I know. Well, I think they, uh, they're, they're raking in the millions by perpetuating this fraud. So yeah, it, it's, it's, uh, often sells better that the unanswered questions instead of here are the facts laid out day after day after day. Right, but, exactly. But, but we now have the book. What was the title of the book again? 
It's called The Amityville Horror, An Inquest into Paranormal Claims. Frank Sindler. Frank Sindler. Nice. Excellent. Well, Darren, thank you for spending so much time with us. I greatly appreciate it. And uh, again, great to have you on. And everyone can go one more time. Give us the website. And, and if someone wants to email you, how can I do that? Yeah, it's the Global Center for Religious Research or GCRR.org. And you can email us at info at GCRR.org. Great. Darren Slade, thank you for coming on The Phil Ferguson Show. Thank you again for being here and listening to The Phil Ferguson Show. My office is starting to get warm again. I was kind of hoping here in the Florida house that it wouldn't get as warm in my office, at least compared to the rest of the house. But I've got the soundboard, computers, monitors, all these things make just a little bit of heat. And so I have to kind of close up the room to do recordings and make the podcast. But afterwards, I got to turn on some big fans and move air around because it's getting a little stuffy, kind of getting to the point where I feel settled in. I have my headphones and uh, the mic that I like to use and some other equipment printer here uh, because around uh, October 1st, going to have to do my quarterly billing. I only get paid four times a year, so uh, it's a big, important time for me. I did announce early on the show in case you missed that, which would be surprising. Uh, you know, maybe you just jumped into the middle of the show. I am temporarily lowering the minimum requirement, the minimum assets under management uh, for Polaris from 5 million to 2 million. If that is your situation, you have at least 2 million that I can help you uh, by creating a plan and managing it for you. Send me an email, phil at polarisfinancialplanning.com. So everything in the house is settling down, except for now we have a new, a new surprise. Uh, as I'm recording this, we're only a couple of days away from a hurricane. Uh, it happens in the fall. It is hurricane season, but I've never had to deal with a hurricane in any significant or meaningful way before. And now I might. So I've heard prognostications that's going to be a category two or three uh, as it comes up into the Gulf, the Gulf of Mexico, and then it will hit Florida. Now, I don't know if it hit Florida at the very bottom or in the middle, but either case, being in and around Orlando, there is the possibility that we will at least get some nice, healthy storms. <laughs> uh, maybe random tornadoes spawned out of a hurricane or something else. The rule of thumb that I've heard for the uh, part of the area that I am in is that uh, the, the hurricane usually loses two, st two uh, categories of strength by the time it gets to Orlando because of the all of the land it has to cross over. That's nice and all, but we could still have sustained winds in the 40s and or 50s and possibly 60s, depending on exactly how strong the storm gets and where it comes on land. I imagine that we're going to get four to six to eight inches of, inches of rain within a day or two. So that's going to be exciting. And we're now starting to learn about what to do to prepare and a really funny thing, um, my wife came back from the uh, grocery store yesterday and all of the meats are on sale. And she found out that as soon as the hurricane is likely to hit the area, there's some rule or law that uh, once the freezers or refrigerators for all of the meats in a store, once the power goes out for more than five minutes, they can no longer sell that product. So what they are doing is they've apparently reduced or stopped inbound meat. Uh, and then when it gets packaged or if it's in, in packaging in the refrigerators, they mark it down and then they mark it down some more and then they mark it down some more and they want to sell every piece of freaking meat. So uh, we had steak last night. <laughs> that was absolutely fantastic. And I don't know what we paid for it, but it was a good discount and the discounts are going to get more dramatic. We've also learned that uh, some stores are already out of paper towels and toilet paper and cleaning supplies and packs of water and bottles of water. So that's fun. Uh, other note, I am still going on my journey with water and the water in the house has a smell to it. 
the general consensus for most people is that it's probably sulfur related, uh, sulfur gas that is created by decay of organic material th that is naturally in the water, naturally occurring because the water that's pulled out of the ground is not that incredibly far down. And the, uh, the terrain here is very porous. So the mixture of uh, surface water and aquifer water is greater than in most areas. So I'm still learning about that, but I have learned uh, that it's a very interesting topic, apparently, for listeners. I, I think I've received more mail about the water issues th than any other topic, even the nefarious Bitcoin topics. But So thank you, everybody, with the ideas and the suggestions. We have just sent off for a uh, elaborate and expensive water testing kit so that we really truly know what's in the water. Because as I described before, uh, around here, people show up and do horse and pony shows or chemistry shows in your kitchen and show you that the, your water is uh, hard, which it is. Uh, mine here, according to the city, because I, I talked to the water engineer, who maybe I'll have on the show if you guys are interested. He said that ours is 9.9 .9 for the hardness, which is in the moderately hard, but not extremely hard. Uh, we just did a home test that said it was between 10 and 15, which means it could still be 10. So there's that. There's the, the sulfur that shows up from biological decay. There is also uh, chlorinated byproducts or chlorine byproducts that are created when the chlorine does its job. And so the total chlorine in our water is a little high, but the actual just chlorine chlorine that has not interacted with any biological things um, might not be that high. So that's why I couldn't smell chlorine but the chlorine content of our water is high and most of it is chlorine having already done its job. So we're going to get the test. We're going to do the testing. Oh, and so many ideas. The, all the local people want to just show up and sell you everything because nobody wants to show up and, and sell, sell you a thousand dollar or 1000 or $500 system. Um, I've done a lot of shopping, a lot of reviews online. And I think I know what I want to get, but I'm waiting for that the testing kit to show up we, we uh, collect the water samples and send it back and hopefully a few days after we send it uh, we will get very very precise numbers on more than 100 different factors of things that could possibly be in our water so looking forward to that uh, so i'll keep you posted as that goes around i guess that's it for today um, and again in late october my wife and I, we will be in Vegas for CSICon and then right after that in San Antonio for the FFRF conference. So if you're at either one of those, we would love to say hello to you. Just come on up, introduce yourself, say hi. I, I look forward to it. I'm so excited to get to kind of more in a normal routine. And now I'm going to end this, mix the show, put it out for you, and then I'm going to go hop in the pool before the hurricane comes in a day or two. I hope to see you out there somewhere. Stay safe. See you soon. Ciao.